Good morning, everybody, and this is the car class. Move over and get myself set up right. And uh, our lesson today is called Nourishing Holiness. We've been talking about what holiness is, and, and today we're going to talk about nourishing holiness. And it comes out of the adult Bible studies, and the lesson is uh, written by Clara Welch. And I'll tell you this, that those of you that go to uh, church uh, after Sunday school, I believe you're going to be able to connect um, a lot of what Chris says uh, to our Sunday school lesson, different Bible verses, and, and but, but very much uh, the same idea, which is things we have to let go of. One of the little chapter type of is entitled therefore get rid of dot 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 what is it we need to get rid of in our lives well our lesson comes from first Peter second 1 through 17 and okay I'm gonna read first uh, Peter second 1 through 10 and it's going to have familiar words in it but us uh, a lot of most of it is is based on the idea of Jesus becoming the word they use as capstone or the main stone in the building and so the author talks about a stone you know what value does a stone have you know, and Jesus becomes the main stone in the building. And so that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about is, is um, what value we have as stones. So the purpose statement is to embrace God's call to live and grow as God's holy people. So it's 1 Peter 2, 1 through 10. Therefore, get rid of all ill will and all deceit, pretense, envy, and slander. Instead, like a newborn baby, desire the pure milk of the word, nourished by it, so you will grow until salvation, since you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now you are coming to him as to a living stone. Even though this stone was rejected by humans from God's perspective, it is chosen, valuable. You yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. You are being made into a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Thus it is written in scripture, look, I am laying a cornerstone in Zion, chosen, valuable. The person who believes in him will never be ashamed. So God honors you who believe. For those who refuse to believe, though the stone the builders tossed aside has become the capstone. This is a stone that makes people stumble on a rock that makes them fall because they refuse to believe in the word they stumble. Indeed, this is the end of which they were appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you, ha you hadn't received mercy, but now you received mercy. The uh, author starts her lesson by uh, talking about liking to garden. And she says, one thing I've learned about gardens over the year is that they need attention if they're going to prosper. Well, I can live the opposite of that. I mean, not the opposite. Anyway, I know that if I'm not paying attention, they're not prospering. And if you look at my yard right now, you think, she, this girl, had not paid attention. <laughs> and that's true. That is a true weakness. And coming from a mama who could grow anything and had the most beautiful roses and, and uh, 
somehow that ability just didn't come over to me. And I don't think it's ability, I think it's, well, a lot of ability, hard work. It's not easy, is it, Janie? <laughs> it doesn't just happen to be a gardener and have your garden thrive. Well, she's, what she's talking about is making, we have to work on our relationship with God. It's like working on a garden. She says, if we do not attend to our relationship with God, we make room for the values of the secular world to encroach in our lives. We find that we, like a garden overtaken by weeds, look more like the surrounding landscape and not like a people set apart as holy before God. And then that's where she goes into the, uh, the idea of what we need to get rid of in our lives. And I know all of us could make a list. Um, mine would, could be very long. I, I uh, should have been working on it this morning. Uh, there are things that we say and do, and then if we could undo, happily we would. The, um, the author is telling us about Peter that when he wrote this letter, uh, and we know who Peter was. What, what was Peter was Simon, and uh, Jesus named him Peter and told him that he, you will be the rock that my church is founded on. And that's a lot, I think, of what's behind what Peter's writing about, is knowing that Jesus said that he would be the rock. But anyway, Peter wrote to the Gentiles, and he wanted them to come to faith in Christ, they lived according to the customs of the pagan culture, she said. And in this section, she talks about the fact that idol worship, the realization of that is that you are worshiping something. You are, Well, maybe I'll put it this way. You are worshiping something that has nothing to offer you and that has not asked for you. And then she goes on and talks about the God that we worship and that the God asks for us. And the God set up a world for us. And the way she words it is talking about, she said, God's call to Abram came with a promise. Leave your land, your family, your father's household for the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and bless you. And then she talks about Moses. She says, before freeing the nation of Israel from bondage in Egypt, God instructed Moses to tell the, tell the Israelites, I take you as my people and I will be your God. And that... Uh, was one of, one of the first covenants, but um, those words have always been um, important to me. Uh, I like the idea of God saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. And it sort of just sets it right out there as to what our relationships are supposed to be. The, um, she goes on and talks about commandments. She said the two greatest commandments that God gave are to love God and to love our neighbor. And then from our uh, Bible verses, get rid of all ill will and deceit, pretense, envy, slander. These words describe harmful and hurtful ways people treat one another. And hearing those words... We know that's true. We know it's actually words we've heard many times before and ideas we've had and heard many times before, especially if you've been to Sunday school and church many times in your life. Uh, that's a lot of what is behind what I think church and Sunday school is about is to get rid of our ill will and deceit. So... What do you need to get rid of in order to love others deeply and earnestly? Well, the author then goes on and talks about a section she says to desire pure milk. And it comes from the Bible verse where uh, 
It says, instead, like a newborn baby, desire the pure milk of the word. Well, that made me think, you know, I can get off on a ramble sometimes. And what that made me think about was um, my uh, three, or almost three, she'll be three April 5th, granddaughter Julia, and I've talked about her before, and Julia uh, has uh, very serious allergies like uh, James does, and I know there are other children uh, that have to deal with allergies, and Julia was born with a, a milk allergy. She can only drink soy milk, and uh, she has uh, cheese, what other, I mean, most dairy products, nuts she's one of those children that can't have nuts uh, they have to keep an epi pen with them where you know wherever she goes she has an epi pen and um she picked up the nut off the floor and ate it and she yeah. had, she's on the way to the hospital can't that, and it. has done that they've had to rush to the hospital a couple of times and uh, you know but you'd never know it to look at her because she's very thriving and uh I refer to her as a mess, <laughs> she is. But um, it so makes me think about, you know, what we think of as pure. And um, I think what this is referring to is the pure milk that comes from a mother or the, the pure love that comes from to each other to to the to the next person but we're all different they're all different things that affect us and that can actually lead us different ways in our life and so much i i think about the this period of time that uh this past year has really been a year i heard that I think yesterday was the a year since the first person had died in Georgia of the uh, virus. And we think of everything that's happened over that this past year, we know that it has been not pure. It has been a struggle. It has been um, all of us, I think, even if we can't see each other in person, knowing that each of us is there and caring and concerned and and even hearing the littlest thing at the beginning was so important to us to know uh, what we could about each other and now to know that we can start gathering again and being together again and 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 keep living together again is so important and peter is is encouraging these gentiles to put Jesus Christ into their lives, to make him be the purity that they need in their lives. Um, the word is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he talks about uh, people growing in their faith. And is that something we ever do? Do we ever stop growing in our, in our faith? I know sometimes I feel like I'm backing up in my faith and then I have to turn around and come back and I can go up and down but I know that growing in our faith never ends um, it doesn't it doesn't end when you're 72 years old matter of fact you need to start learning more stuff and and not thinking that you've learned all there is out there because there are a whole bunch of books back there I haven't read <laughs> I need to get to it Anyway, her next chapter she calls Receive and Give Mercy. And I love the name of that chapter because I thought receiving mercy, what a blessing that is. If any of you have had to be forgiven for something that you've said or done, um, I will stand at the front of the line on that uh, more than once. And then the giving mercy, forgiving somebody. And sometimes that can be very hard to do, to forgive somebody of something. And sometimes it's not even a big thing. Sometimes it can be a little thing. 
and somehow it gets in our brain and just kind of gets in there and, and, and you can't forget it. And um, that's a shame. And that's, that is something we need to work on. Receive and give mercy. So this is well, one of her chapters, or paragraph, excuse me. Part of what it means to taste the goodness of God is to experience God's grace, forgiveness, undeserved compassion, and mercy. We <clears throat> nourish holiness when we extend compassion and mercy to others, when forgiveness and love guide our relationships to, with other people. We, who are individuals and groups in your community who need to hear a word of forgiveness and receive God's gift of mercy? Now, see, I thought that was an interesting sentence. Who are individuals and groups who need to hear a word of forgiveness and receive God's gift of mercy? See, I wasn't expecting that. I don't even really know how to answer that. Uh, I know how to say that I need those things, forgiveness and mercy. Um, I don't know how, what to do with that sentence, so I said I'll read on from there. We nourish holiness when we treat others with Christ-like love, when we embrace God's call to live and grow as holy people. We accept our place among the living stones that built Christ's church. And it ends, she ends with talking about, again, being a living stone. And as they're, what they're describing a stone as um, being something basically worthless. There are so many stones out there in, our, in front of us, in the ground, on our driveway, and what this is about is that Jesus became the stone, and like I said at the beginning, the capstone that made it all the best it could be. And how things that seem to have no worth are really extremely valuable and worthy. And um, Larry builds furniture and uh, right now he's building, in the process of building, a table for Jenny's new kitchen that they had redone. And so he had to find just the right w wood. And he has a friend who planes wood and everything and cuts it down. And he had already bought a lot of just wood from, I mean, Larry would go out and just buy wood. And I'm like, really? Do you? <laughs> he does. And he has other friends that do the same. They store it up until they think they need a piece and then they go and ramble through all the stacks of wood to find just the right wood. And he thinks that he's found some that he thinks is gonna be just right. And so when Jenny came over yesterday, they had to rush out to look at just the right piece of wood. And I said- The wood is one piece see. over two feet wide and two inches thick and it's worth coming Hanging on to. <laughs> <laughs> it is valuable. It is valuable. But isn't it? I mean, that's how we can look at what is in our lives. Things that seem to be, we, how much do we need this? And it turns into be a beautiful piece of furniture. It turns into be the beautiful temple uh, that that was built. It turns into be this beautiful church made of just, you know, a lot of red brick. And it turns out they are extremely valuable when you put it all together and then you fill it full of wonderful people. So the things that seem worthless in our lives really can give us the most value. And he's talking about the people in our lives and how we live our lives. So. What do you long for in your relationship with God? Where do you need spiritual nourishment so that you may live more faithfully as a person, holy and set aside for God? All right, let's end in prayer. Holy Lord, nourish us with the pure milk of your word 
Thank you for calling us your people. Thank you for your love, compassion, and mercy. Open our hearts to extend your love, compassion, and mercy to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you next week.